If you have a Bible, you can turn along with me to 2 Peter. Uh, once again, 2 Peter chapter number 1, and we're going to pick up this afternoon at verse 5 where we left off, and then we're going to uh, make our way down, especially to verse 11, and we'll just use 12 to 15 as a little bit of a conclusion, uh, but verses 5 to 11 especially. Uh, and as always, a little sermon notes page, hopefully just gives you a quick little summary, a little outline. Uh, all the kids' questions, I forgot to, I forgot to update those. I made, a, I made two mistakes today. I didn't print out the song this morning, and I didn't change the kids' questions. I just looked at that. So uh, my mistake, kids. So uh, this morning, I asked you to draw a little picture of a foundation. Uh, this message is about what's built on top. So the house, okay, on top of that uh, foundation. So 2 Peter chapter 1, beginning at verse 5. Let's pick up where we left off this morning. Uh, verse 5, where he says, For this very reason... Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ." For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have, I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up by way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. And so again, loved ones, to all these words, God's people say, Amen. Amen. So again, what's the foundation of your Christian life from what we saw this morning? Grace. grace, right? Lots of ways we can explain that, but grace, right? One word, one word, grace. Uh, and you're called, you're called then to live a godly life on the basis of grace, of what Jesus has already given to you. He's granted to you as our king, as your king, as my king, He's granted to you as a king all that is necessary for eternal life and godliness. Okay? Eternal life and godliness. It's important for us because the foundation of grace then is what we build our Christian life upon. Uh, upon that grace. And I say that because oftentimes we think about the grace of God is what saves us. And what we mean by that is just we're forgiven of our sins and we're given like you know the deed to eternal life that we get to cash in, in the last day and we forget that the grace of jesus has also granted to us if i didn't stress that enough this morning just to stress it again that not only has the grace of jesus christ granted to us eternal life but also god all that's necessary for godliness because we can think about the grace of god as forgiving us of our sins and then we've got to do a bunch of other stuff or that we've been given eternal life and then we've got to kind of show ourselves worthy of that the rest of our lives. So over here on this platform is eternal life built on a solid foundation of Jesus and his grace. But then I'm over here in the sinking quicksand and I've really got to dig myself out of that hole and I've got to get myself back up on the platform. That's how we view the Christian life sometimes. As opposed to what Peter is telling us here that Jesus in his kingly grace and divine power grants us and gifts us and graces us with everything that we need for eternal life and godliness. They're not really two things. They're the same thing. For all that we need for eternal life and godliness. So the foundation of the Christian life is grace. And then we build upon that in response, right? We say that some, in simple terms, we talk about guilt, grace, and gratitude. So we build upon that foundation of grace uh, in gratitude. So this afternoon, just for a few minutes, we'll think about how Peter says to build on the gracious foundation that you and I have as we practice 
the Christian life. So just notice there those three little points that help us outline the passage here. Uh, so first of all, how do I practice the Christian faith? How do I practice the Christian faith? That's verses 5 through 7. Peter says, grow. Grow in faith. Grow in faith. Now let me read you a quote, and you think about this quote before we look at the verses. Okay, here, here it is. Quote, they should prove their faith by their good works. Meaning Christians. Christians, they, should prove their faith by their good works. If you like that quote, raise your hand. If you don't like that quote, raise your hand. You don't like Martin Luther, George? <laughs> That's Martin Luther in his commentary on this very passage. So I didn't make it up, okay? Take it up with Martin Luther when you see him in heaven, okay? Uh, that, that's Martin Luther. That Christians should prove their faith by their good works. Why did he say that? Okay, it seems a little shocking, right? I mean, obviously, it's like kind of out of context, but when you hear a quote like that, sometimes it's a trick question, so the pastor is always trying to stump you, okay, and try to trip you up so that I can build you back up, okay? Uh, so why did Martin Luther say that? Well, because of what Peter says right here, okay? For this very reason, all that he's just said, the grace of Jesus granting to us all that's necessary for life and godliness. He's effectually called us. He's graciously granted us. And he promises us eternal life. For this reason, 100% all of grace. For that reason, because it's all of grace, make every effort. Make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness, godliness, godliness, brotherly affection, brotherly affection with love. Authentic Christian faith, then, is active, isn't it? Authentic Christian faith is productive. It's productive. Notice that little word, supplement. Supplement, the ESV says. Make every effort to supplement your faith. Uh, this... Uh, this word was used in ancient uh, Greek society for a person who would uh, provide the money for the chorus, the choir, that would sing in a theatrical production. So think about the great amphitheater, say, in Ephesus that sat like 40,000 people. And there was a guy, uh, mostly a guy, uh, who would provide the money to pay for the choir that would sing in the theatrical production. Now, by the time of the first century, when Peter is writing, uh, it, it takes on a more generic sense of a generous benefactor or a donor, right? So, you know, you're driving on the road like, I, like I'm doing a lot, and uh, you know, I'm listening to like 91.5, which is KUSC, which is the classical channel, uh, and it seems like it's always fundraising drive, right? It's always fundraising season. Be a, be a benefactor, you know, be a donor, put a cool sticker on, the, on your bumper, um, whatever, right? Be a generous giver uh, for some, you know, art, uh, because those things aren't publicly funded uh, to their full extent. So um, what Paul is, or what Peter is saying then is that you as a believer, and he says, make every effort to supplement your faith, he's saying freely respond. We might say freely give back to God generously, because God has so generously given you all that you need in Christ, generously respond by growing in your faith. Okay, by growing in your faith. No, notice, this is not payment to God. We're not paying God back, okay? No sense of that at all, ever, in the Christian life. No, but we respond graciously, generously, freely, like an ancient benefactor who gave money for a chorus or a choir uh, in a public play or theater. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, you, uh, if you ever do a drive through coffee. You ever do that? You ever drive through coffee? Well, John does. We know that. John's always bringing in the Dutch bros. Um, but, <laughs> but Dutch bros is too expensive for my illustration. So, uh, you know, you get, a, you get a downgrade to like uh, Starbucks or Caden, my fa new favorite, Better Buds. Okay? Um, you know, if you've ever gone to a drive through coffee place, uh, maybe this is just like coffee culture. I don't know. Uh, and you, get up to, you, get, you drive up, you're, the, you're finding the person at the window, and, and they open the window up, and, and you're about to pay. Uh, and the, you ever had this experience? The person says, oh, the car in front of you has already paid for your coffee. 
Anybody ever had that experience? No? Maybe I have like a secret pastor vibe or whatever going on, and I get that. Um, but uh, you know, it's not all the time. It's a few times, a few times. Never at Dutch Bros. The Dutch are too, the too, are too cheap for that. Um, <laughs> it's always at Starbucks, right? It's always at Starbucks. Um, so, uh, well, how does that make you feel? Well, you know, someone's graciously paid for you. They've, they've given you the thing that you don't deserve, that you didn't ask for it, you didn't pay for it. You know, I don't know, you did, maybe you had a sticker in your car and they liked, whatever. Uh, so how does it make you feel? Well, you know, you feel some sense of thankfulness and gratitude. So, okay, well, then I, they paid for my coffee. Uh, I'll pay for the person behind, uh, behind me, the car behind me. So grace begets gratitude. Grace begets gratitude. Uh, new life in Christ. New, being new in Christ begets growing in Christ, right? We are, we are infants in Christ. We've got to become toddlers in Christ. We, we're toddlers in Christ. We've got to become uh, elementary students in Christ. We're elementary students. We've got to become teenagers uh, in Christ. And then we've got to go, become adults and then mature adults in Christ. So faith, he says, faith here uh, leads to virtue uh, or goodness. And that virtue then... Uh, should then uh, you should add to your virtue, your godliness, your goodness, knowledge, right? The knowledge between what's good and what's wrong, uh, what's right and wrong, good and evil. Knowledge, the self-control, self-control to steadfastness, to being persevering in your faith, right? Through good times and bad. We're going to see that in chapter two, where he says uh, that we know as believers that the Lord is able to deliver the righteous out of suffering. So have steadfastness, perseverance, grit. Steadfastness leads to godliness. <clears throat> godliness leads to brotherly affection. That's, uh, that's the, the Greek term Philadelphia. Okay? Philadelphia, brotherly uh, affection. Whenever, whenever I see that word Philadelphia in the New Testament, I can, I, I can never, at this point in my life, I, can, I have to always think about uh, Lauren's mom, Barbara. Uh, Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love, but she told me once, she said, no, it's really the bro- uh, city of brotherly shove. Okay, city of brotherly shove, not brotherly love. So Philadelphia, it's the brotherly affection, brotherly love that we have as believers. And then that leads to agape or love, right? Love as, as, as we experience God's love, and then we seek to show that love as well. Uh, notice how verse 8 describes this continual growth in these practices. Again, as Luther said, the believers should prove their faith by their good works, right? We are, we are to make every effort to supplement our faith with all these uh, godly things, right? These practices. So verse 8 describes a continual growing in these practices. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, notice that, and are increasing. There's no, there's no stagnant Christian life. We're moving forward or we're moving back. They keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful, Notice the the growing kind of language there. Or unfruitful in the knowledge. Again, it's not just intellectual, but it's the knowledge of coming to know him. We saw in verse uh, verse number uh, three. Uh, The knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we want to be effective, right? So don't be ineffective and unfruitful. We want to be effective and fruitful. Amen? So weed the garden of your hearts. Aerate it. Aerate it. Water it. Fertilize it. That's, that's our task. That's our task, okay? Uh, verse number nine, Peter says this in a negative way. So first of all, it's positive, and he says it states it negatively. For whoever lacks these qualities, right? So if you have these qualities, you're, in, you're increasing these things, then you're productive and fruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. If you don't have these things, whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he's blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sin. So blindness, of course, not being able to see. Uh, nearsightedness, not being able to see out into the distance. Forgetfulness, not being able to see what's behind you. Okay? So if you don't have these qualities, you can't see what you've come out of. You can't see the past, your past. You can't see what's in front of you, everlasting life. And you're blind, he says. It's like you're blind. But don't forget, he says, you've already been cleansed. Right? Don't be nearsighted. Don't be blind. Don't be forgetful that you were cleansed from your former sins. 
In other words, as we like to say uh, in this church, remember your baptism. That's what he says here. Remember your baptism. Why? Because baptism is an outward, tangible sign and assurance to us from God, our God of grace, that he's already cleansed, forgiven, and washed us. Don't forget. You've been cleansed. You've been washed. You've been forgiven. You've been made new. You've been clothed with Christ. You've put off the old man. You've put on the new man. Don't forget that. And when you remember that, that's the grace and the mercy of God that stirs us up to be fruitful, to be effective, to be growing, to be increasing in these qualities of the Christian life. And so, brothers and sisters, grow in your faith. That's what Peter says here. Grow in your faith. Be fruitful in your faith with all these virtues, all these qualities. And to do that, recall your baptism. Look back. You have been cleansed from your former sin. So, Secondly, how do I practice the Christian faith? Verse 10. Verse 10. How do I practice the Christian faith? Peter says, confirm your calling. So grow in faith. Grow in faith. Secondly, confirm your calling. Therefore, brothers, right? Notice the therefore, okay? Remember your baptism. That's the last thing he's been talking about here. You've, you've been cleansed of your former sins. So therefore, remembering that, brothers, sisters, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. You will never uh, fall. Excuse me. You will never fall. So right off the bat, when we see that verse, right off the bat, let me say that knowing God has cleansed you of your sins leads to diligence of the Christian life. Notice that. Right? This is, Peter is thinking as, as a follower of Jesus that knowing that you're forgiven leads to diligence in the Christian life. The verb he uses there, be diligent. It's in what's called the middle voice, signifying that the one, uh, he, the one uh, of whom he's speaking is the one who's active, us. So we are active. We are to be, to be diligent. It's not that Christ was diligent for us. No, it's that you are to be diligent in response to the grace and the mercy of God. Don't ever use, right? This is important for us as as believers and uh, for me as pastor to remind you. Don't ever use any Christian doctrine, whether it's election, calling, justification, whatever it might be, forgiveness. Don't ever use Christian doctrine to make you feel or say... I'm done. Let go and let God. Right? No. No, no, no. A thousand times. No. A thousand and one times. That's not how we are to respond to the grace and the mercy of God. I'm good to go. I got my ticket to heaven. I got my get out of jail free card. You know, I can just let go and let God. And, you know, it's all of grace. After all, that's what the pastor said. It's all of grace. Well, yeah, it is. And grace also, we're going to see here, grace also is what moves you to be diligent uh, and to be productive and to be fruitful. The second thing to say about this verse is this. We are called to confirm. Notice, notice the verb. Confirm our calling and election. Okay? We are, to, we are to confirm it. So circle that word. In the previous passage, I mentioned that it's God who sends out a general call to the world, the gospel, but more importantly, an effectual, powerful call. Who's the one who predestines? God. Who's the one who effectually calls sinners, like you and me? God. Who justifies? Who regenerates and makes new? God, right? God, 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 God. It's all of him. It's all of grace. You and I are called to confirm. To confirm. You didn't call yourself. You didn't predestine yourself. You didn't justify yourself. You didn't give yourself a new life. You weren't born again by yourself. So don't think that you're God. Don't think that you had anything to do with that. No, you didn't. All of God, all of grace, 100%. Let God be God. At the same time, though, you and I are, are to confirm what God has done. Right? So God does the work. We're just confirming it. Right? We're just confirming it. So he's not saying here, uh, become elect, become called, do it. No, confirm it. 
confirm it. How? Again, by growing, by being fruitful, by being effective in your Christian faith. When you do that, it confirms what deep down inside you know by grace. God has chosen me. God has called me. God has saved me. God has forgiven me of my past sins. God's elected me. Uh, God has justified me. Uh, God has made me new in Jesus Christ. God has done all this work. And when I am showing that in daily life, that just confirms the reality that's already there. Okay? Notice the benefit of that. If you practice these qualities of verses 5, 6, and 7, you will never fall. You will never fall. So we, we say, don't we, that uh, uh, when there's fruit, there's evidence of root. Okay? When there's fruit, there's evidence of root. But more than that, the roots that Peter's talking about keep the fruit on the tree, on the tree, and he keeps the tree standing. So our fruitfulness, our effectiveness, our growing and growth in the Christian life uh, doesn't make the roots appear. The roots are already there. But all that effectiveness of the tree as it grows and blossoms and, and uh, overgrows even in, in fruitfulness. That's just proving the point that there's deep roots, there's strong roots that are already there. Uh, in this case, it's God uh, who's done that work. So be diligent and practice faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, steadfastness, godliness, brotherly affection, and love. Because these confirm your calling and election by God, from God, and unto God, into his everlasting glory. And that leads to our last point. That leads to our last point here. How do I practice a Christian faith? So we, we want to grow in our faith. We want to confirm our calling by that growing. Uh, and then also this. Peter says, walk towards glory. Walk towards glory. For in this way of growing in faith, confirming calling and election, in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In this way will be provided, richly provided for you, an entrance into the ever, uh, eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So one of our Reformation confessions, uh, the Canons of Dort, the, what I call the Canons of Dort, uh, we read about the doctrine of predestination and election in that uh, confession, a lot in there. Um, and it says that there's one and the same predestination in the election of salvation for all those who are saved from the Old Testament all the way to the New Testament. So everybody's saved the same way. One God, one Savior, one salvation. And salvation is by the same way. The grace of God, faith in the Messiah to come or the Messiah who has come, right? So there's one way of salvation. Uh, then there's this beautiful line. I'm going to read this little beautiful line. It helps us understand what the writer Peter is saying here. <clears throat> Scripture declares that there is a single good pleasure, purpose, and plan of God's will. So a single good pleasure, purpose, plan of God's will, by which God chose us from eternity. So there's just one plan of God by which he's chosen us from eternity past, both to grace and to glory. Okay, so, so far so good. There's one plan of God, one purpose of God, one good pleasure of God to save sinners like you and me, to choose us from all of eternity past before we even existed. And that plan was that we would be chosen to grace, meaning that we, are, we become saved in this life, and to glory, eternal life forever and ever and ever. Then it says this. So the same thing. So both to grace in this life and glory, the life to come, both to salvation and to the way of salvation, which he prepared in advance for us to walk in. Did you hear that? both to salvation and the way of salvation, which he, God, prepared in advance for us to walk in. In other words, God hasn't just chosen you to salvation so that, again, you can just take a siesta and wait for heaven to come. 
He's also chosen the way in which you are going to walk until you get to glory and eternal life. Where does that line come from? The way, uh, 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 both to salvation and the way of salvation. Where, where does this part come from? Which he prepared in advance for us to walk in. Where does that come from? Book of Ephesians, right? We were just in that, our most recent book. Where? Do you know where? It's like a very famous section there, chapter 2, right? You were dead in trespasses, but God, in the very end, verse 10 of that little passage, verse 10, that we've been predestined to good works, right? To walk in them. So what's the way to salvation, to glory? Speaking of salvation here in terms of like the ultimate goal of the Christian life. What's the way? What's the path? The path, the way that we walk on, that we live in, is that path of growing in faith and confirming our calling. And what's the goal of growing in faith and confirming our calling? What's the, what's the end result? Entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? So the Christian is going to be productive. The Christian's going to be fruitful. The Christian's going to look back and say, I was baptized. I've been cleansed of all my sins. Uh, therefore, I want to be diligent to confirm God's call and election in my life. He planted me in Christ, and those roots are things that I didn't do. The seed itself is not a thing that I did. The watering, all the pruning, all the watering, uh, all, the, all the tilling, the, the aerating, the, the weeding, all that cultivating is all God's. But I want to be diligent to add to my faith, uh, to be productive in faith, hope, and love. And so walk, loved ones, he's saying to us. Walk on the straight and narrow path of godliness. That's the result of God's amazing grace to you in Jesus Christ. Notice that. The fruitfulness, the effectiveness, the growing, the walking, the confirming, all this stuff that Peter is talking about, these are all the results of the grace of Jesus Christ in your life. Amen? Amen. It's all of grace. Even the, the walking, even the fruitfulness, right? It's all because of grace. It's all motivated by grace. It's all uh, infused with God's grace. It's uh, God's grace in us, causing us to even want to desire to love him, to be faithful, to be full of love, uh, to, to be uh, full of perseverance, virtues, self-control, and so forth. So walk on the straight and narrow path of godliness. That's the result of the amazing grace of God to you in Jesus Christ. And so he concludes here, uh, and I want to conclude as well, there, verses 12 through 15, just to mention this, that three times the apostle summarizes all this, concludes all this section of his epistle with the word remind. Notice that it's three times. So Peter wanted to remind his readers of this, and so I want to remind you as well. Verse 12. I intend always to remind you of these qualities. Though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. You know this stuff already, but you're going to hear it again. Okay? That's what Peter's saying. That's, that's the apostles' method. Christians know this stuff, but Christians have to be told again and again and again and again and again. Okay, so I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Verse 13, I think it right to stir you up by way of reminder. There it is again. Verse 15, I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things. Remind you of these qualities stir you up to, by way of reminder that you might at any time be able to recall these things. To grow in your faith, to confirm your calling, and to be on the path walking towards glory. Let's pray. 